Hello. This is Jennifer Auger and David Hornick. Um, so happy to be with you. Um, I thought we'd start off our um, webinar by saying, first of all, thank you, David, for being here. Um, David and I are not only close friends, but we both have share a love of story. Um, David, because he's actually good at it. Me, because I actually study why it works, um, so to speak. So just to start it off, six-word story about yourself, David. Six words about me. Okay. Uh, when my voice changed, no Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And mine would be California girl in New York shoes. So, uh, and we'll dive into that, but it's, yeah. it's a good, like, good opener for those of you guys who are interested in starting your next meeting with a six-word story to prime people to start thinking about story. Uh, Ernest Hemingway was once known to have written the first six-word story that at least got notoriety, baby shoes never for sale, never worn. Baby shoes for sale, mm, never worn. That tells a lot, actually. I mm. know. So, you know, this idea of... I guess that's why he did that for a living. You know, <laughs> that's why he's better than California girl in New York shoes. So what I wanted to do is give you a little bit um, uh, of, of, of a glimpse, and David, you haven't seen this either, um, of some of um, my research around happiness and meaning and, and how, is it, how it unfolds in terms of almost a story. Uh, it's a very large data set, um, and it's based on the We Feel Fine uh, data comb where Sepp Kumbar and Jonathan Harris combed the blogosphere for all mentions of I feel and I am feeling. So 12 million data points collapsed into this one slide. Uh, because blog based data has a lot of demographics you can uh, extract from it, you can, you know, interpret what people are feeling, when they're feeling it, and so this is over the course of three years. We start out simple. So this is your 11 to 14 year old who uh, doesn't really have anything to say about I feel, like I feel fine, I feel nothing, I feel what? Uh, but we soon fill up with angst. So this is your 15 to 18 year old who feels really angsty. So I feel angsty and alone and anxious and angry. Uh, when they do feel happy, it's excitement. So it's literally happiness means excitement at that age. Uh, and then we move to feelings of confinement. So this is the 19 to 22 year old who often feels alone or not understood until we leave those behind to go conquer the world at age 25. We feel powerful when we feel happy or the opportunity to get money, status, or destiny before gradually trading ambition for balance. This is a 30-year-old who's now searching uh, for balance, developing an appreciation for our body. So at 35, we start talking about how we feel fat or whatever because our bodies are now going downhill in a systematic way. And our children um, and an evolving sense of connectedness. So I feel connected, grateful, happy, calm, and blessed. And, the 50 to 60 year olds who are blogging, you know, equate happiness with feeling contentment. And the reason I share this slide, just to kind of jumpstart our conversation, is because it's not just the story of our customers, you know, so you think you have a value proposition that's really hitting it for millennials, but the reality is, is that they fundamentally will change in every five or so years their meaning of happiness and what's driving their decisions is going to change. It's the story of our employees. And so you're building a team um, and you're trying to grow that team and you're trying to scale um, the business and, and, and what our employees need in life is going to change. And it's certainly the story of us um, as individuals. Um, the other reason this insight is interesting is that as you start to think about building new products or building businesses, I think we've moved away from just designing with features in mind uh, to um, a life where really we're thinking much more about that emotional experience. Certainly with Apple, um, you know, companies have started to really understand what's not just the features but the emotional experience. And I think you're seeing more and more successful companies design not just based on features and emotional experience but really stories. What is the story? And David and I are going to talk about that. But before we do so, let me just um, mention a few uh, tips about I think what I see at least most companies doing wrong is they design a story and how you can design for a better story just to give you a framework before we jump into examples. The first thing you see is that a lot of companies don't design for authenticity well um, or empathy or purpose. So if you design for authenticity when, such that when you share the story, you feel authentic and lots of research shows that people can tell when you aren't. In fact, within milliseconds, 
of engaging with someone and they're sharing your story, uh, implicit judgments are being made on that person. You know, whether you're truthful, whether I'm going to respect you, whether I'm going to like you. This is work by Melanie and Body uh, that was summarized in Blink and other books. Uh, brands, and here's the problem, brands or companies often feel manufactured and overly marketed, but people do not, and that's why you're seeing, um, I think, a role of story being greater and greater, especially within startups who have no budget to even look manufactured, and, and the role of story within leaders uh, like CEOs uh, becoming more and more important because people, you know, don't feel manufactured. A second thing I think you see a lot is that most companies aren't doing a good enough job of designing for empathy. So they got their product, they're so excited about it, and they're ready to roll. And they often implicitly are making the mistake of trying to be the hero. So, you know, we've got this great product, we've got all these features, we're going to go take on the world and be the hero. But if instead you really anchor on this idea that the user is the hero, um, the customer is the hero, he or she has these, you know, big desires in life, they have these challenges, they're trying to unlock those challenges, and your only role is to help them unlock their own challenges so, as, so that, that they can be the hero of their own story. And that there's a couple of things that relegates your product and your company to the rightful purpose of, of being servant to, you know, kind of your user. You're just trying to help them become the hero of that story. It doesn't matter if you're enterprise or, or customer, that's the right role. And the second thing it does is it really does allow you to feel much more empathic to your customer and your user, and, and that deep empathy will serve you well as you innovate and move on. And the third thing I think companies maybe don't spend as much attention on as they should is, is what really is the purpose? What's the why behind what they're doing? Um, a really simple phrase to underscore the importance of this is that, by and large, employees want to be valued members of a winning team on an inspired mission. And so when you get productivity that decreases or creativity that decreases or the team's just not performing, usually go back to the sentence and you say, what word is missing, you know, and, and they need to feel valued, they need to feel like they're members, and they need to feel like the team is winning, or if it's not winning now, why is it going to be winning in the future? And it has to have this inspired mission that is deeper and broader and more inspirational than just maximizing profitability. So as you start to think a little bit about, you know, what this means, you're going to think about, you know, what's the purpose, what's that inspired mission? What's, you know, what's the autonomy I'm affording to employees so that they can really feel valued? Um, how strong is the team? Um, you know, so how, how, how well are you collaborating? And, and to what degree is your goal excellent so that you can feel you're, you're on this path? And what's interesting and what David, I think, has been exposed to over the course of his career are these CEOs that implicitly take on often one of these elements. So if you look at John Mackey doubling down on purpose or Larry and Sergey really believing in autonomy, hire super smart people, not necessarily those with a purpose, but just super smart people that and this would allow them to be autonomous to some degree. Tony Shea, who really believes in creating a family, um, and so he's going to, you know, hire people that are kind of a little weird and quirky and then get them to act in very f sort of familial ways. And then uh, Steve Jobs, obviously, who hired much more for excellence and designed for excellence. And, um, and so what happens is with these leaders and these CEOs, the story of what's important to them gets played out and that inculcates the whole, whole culture. Um, but uh, in a lot of research, if you really nail purpose, and all of these companies do have purpose, um, then you usually get people to work harder, faster. Um, so that's just a brief summary of what um, at least you can start to think about in terms of, uh, of designing for. Um, but getting into the nitty-gritty, how do you actually design these stories? Which stories are most important? What are the signature stories that you want to develop? Um, and, and David and I have talked about this in the past, and David really thinks there, there's four, at least in his mind, in his context, from a venture perspective, and maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, your background and how you see story. But four that are particularly important are contributing to a successful pitch, so a, a story that seals the deal, uh, organizing your team, so David calls this sort of the wiki of your organization, um, connecting to your customer, sort of that user story, closing the sale, and then a story to spur growth, which, you know, you know what's the story of why this is going to be huge. So, David, thanks for being here, and maybe you could tell us a little, little bit about your own self, and then 
we can dive into any and all of these that you think are so important. Sure. Although, I mean, you know the most important part, which is I, I was destined for Broadway and then my voice changed. It yeah. Was, it was going to be so good. Yeah. And then uh, next thing you know, I went to law school. So, uh, <laughs> no, I've been, I've been uh, in the venture capital world for uh, almost 15 years now. And what, you know, as I was just talking with a group of students and frankly, my entire, my entire talk, this was a group of college students who were trying to figure out, oh, so where, what do we do next? Where do we go next? How do we think about our, our world? And so I told the tale of how I went from, you know, from a, a kid in New Hampshire to a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, someone who got to college and studied computer music to, you know, to, to a business person. And the reality is that it was this windy path that was driven. And if you were to tell the story of me in the end, one could only point to passion, to engagement, right? Because the the subject matter changed so quickly. It was computer music and then criminology. It was law school and then litigation, et cetera. But ultimately ended up in building, helping to build these amazing companies. And, 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 to my mind, the, 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 these amazing stories that every one of these companies tells, even the companies that fail, it turns out, it's an epic tale, right? It just turns out badly. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not like all of our movies are fantastically joyous in the end, and that's true. No matter, even in the very best venture capitalists, there are companies that, uh, with the very best venture capitalists, there are companies where the end of the tale is, and it fails, right? But in the same respect, you know, even in those instances, I worked with a very young, very smart, energetic entrepreneur who had his first company was uh, encumbered by by lawsuits. They were doing this peer-to-peer -peer distribution of content that was that was copyright protected, and they got sued into submission. And his second company, he said, "Oh, that was a hard product project, but it was really valuable to use." everybody's computers to deliver content. He created a content distribution network that allowed you know, ESPN and the likes to move their content. That, con that story ended in a sale to a company that was a fine outcome, but it, was, but, it, but it wasn't what we'd all hoped for. And now he runs uh, Uber. <laughs> and uh, so far, it's looking like that's quite a story, right? Yeah. That, that's quite an, a battle between you know, technology and and uh, and and the entrenched nature of an industry and all of these things. So I really do think of the of of the companies that I look at and look and my engagement and my role with these companies is how can I help bring to life, uh, you know, this this uh, this epic tale that if all goes well ends in something that changes the world. Right? Mm -hmm. And my job is to make money for my investors. So it. The good news is that money actually is a byproduct of really great stories, yeah. you know, in the venture world. So I've invested in in some wonderful companies that have changed the way people, you know, engage with the world, like an Evite or a StumbleUpon. I've engaged in companies that are really technical and people haven't heard but have been wild successes like a Splunk. Um, and then I've engaged with some amazing entrepreneurs whose businesses have not succeeded, uh, but but I but I view those as a gift too. So that give give you a sense of you know kind of my um, my approach to the venture world. And so the other thing you guys in the audience should know is that um, one of the things I admire the most about David is that within the venture world he's um, he's I don't know I think the best storyteller. He lives he lives in a way that's very um, story inspired. So the narratives that come out of not just his entrepreneurs and not just August Capital, but also his family are um, are funny, engaging, inspirational, and then in the case of business, you know, actually matter in, in terms of the bottom line. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about each of these four stories. So the first one that I think um, uh, you talk a lot about is, you know, that story that seals the deal. And your pre premise is that, um, you know, basically, you're not going to invest in technology. You're investing in people who exude uh, creative potential, combined with that urgency to solve a daunting problem with a new approach. And so, your pitch needs to demonstrate both. So, um, so tell us a little bit about sort of the things you see um, in general for that pitch that go wrong, yeah. and/or like when they do it right. What what's the magic sauce? 
Well, the one one thing that I would say is a, an important, you know, tip is that people think that they need to come in and close you, right? That, oh, okay, I'm going to tell you this thing and you're going to buy, all right? When it all is done, you know, oh, I'm in, right? Yeah. Um, and the reality is that like like a lot of stories, like, you know, the things that we find most most epic and engaging, it's just the, the that first conversation, our, our relationships with our spouses, whatever, that first conversation, you leave and think, I I need to learn more about that. Like I need I need some more of that. Yeah. And truthfully, the most successful pitches in any instance are that they are, wow. Like oh my god, that was so great. I a I really want to spend more time with that person or that group of people because I find them engaging and they know things about the world that I want to know. They're thinking about things that I want to think about. And then secondly that's a really interesting business. Like I hadn't thought about, you know, pick your random thing I've invested in. I hadn't thought about, you know, cash payments for, you know, you know, in the digital world or whatever. Yeah. And so, um, so the really great storytellers engage you. They get you, you know, they, they, they start out and they get you thinking about, oh, here's, here, uh, you know, this is a team of people who care and are, and are, are thinking on a deeper level about something that matters, and then they get you with them, it matters. What is this thing? And look, I've funded payroll companies. I've funded, you know, things where you would say, oh, how do you, you know, how do you go to bed and, and, and lie awake at night thinking about these things? But I do because the teams that are building them have engaged you in a way where you say, oh, my goodness, if you were to change the way payroll is done today, millions of small business owners can you know, can have a better life, can better, you know, can manage their businesses better, et cetera. Well, you don't go into the meeting thinking that. You go into the meeting thinking, I wonder what's for lunch, and uh, I've probably had enough Diet Cokes for the day, and then you leave the meeting thinking, oh, my God, I have to work with these people. Yeah. And neurologically what's happening um, when these people pitch David and then they do engage is that the story relative to just saying this is our technology, this is what we're able to do, Neurologically, um, more parts of his brain are activated. When someone pitches him just with features or technology, literally you fall asleep because only one part of the brain is activated. You're cognitively processing those features. When you share a story and then David gets to know that, that, you know, that pitch person, this protagonist, if you will, um, broader parts of the brain and more parts of the brain are actually activated, and that's why you go to sleep and start you know, ruminating, and then the story becomes bigger and it becomes part of you. Um, great. So let's jump into the second one, which is the wiki of your organization, a story that can work as an internal fulcrum and in which your team can stress test business uh, decisions. So it informs your, your role, the team's role, and the company's role. So a lot of times this is kind of the team story, but then it can be a little bit richer. Yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, sometimes these, these stories are kind of chunked into here are the here are the goals of the company, or these are the, 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 the moral touch points of the company, and then those become stories in and of themselves. And so, there, you know, like everything, there are good stories and there are bad stories. So I had one business I'd invested in, and they had their 10 tenants of the, of the business. And one of them, which I 100% believed in, as a, young, as a young venture capitalist with a young family, it was work-life balance. We're going to focus on work-life balance. It was part of the story of this business. Well, it turns out that the story of work-life balance is actually not about work. It's about life and balance. And so when the story of your company is about work-life balance, then the, the cadence of your company actually is, can be slower, can be, you know, it, it, it's, it's okay to take your business and make it second fiddle to the, the obligations you have at home, et cetera. And, and while I understand that, it had a real and material impact in the, at the, in the velocity of this business. So sometimes the stories you tell have unintended consequences, which is in that instance, the story is that this is a family-friendly business and we want people who have families and who care about them to be part of it. And I think that's a fantastic message. The byproduct was, and as a result, it's okay that we're going at this business slowly. Yeah. And, you know, interestingly, I talked with that entrepreneur in the second instance when he was starting his next business, and um, and he said, and again, has small children, is, this is as good of a family man as you will ever meet, yeah. and said, under no circumstances, work-life balance, the message of my next company. Yeah. It's not, you know, 
and 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 so that's just a little thing. Then there's this. Then you know you talk about company culture, and company culture is this. Um, you know, it's sort of in the ether. Oh, how do you describe culture? How do you create it? But the reality is you create it by having these, the, the ethos, the epic tale of this company. What are we here to do? What are we, you know, what is it we're trying to solve? You know, I have a company called Fastly that I've invested in. And Fastly is a new content distribution network. It's, you know, it's a competitor to the likes of Akamai. Very technical, you know, the mission is to deliver content quickly or whatever. You can you can look in and say, okay, well, what's that? How do you create the ethos? It is such a technical team. It is so they are so deeply committed to the idea of of moving the technology forward, of making of everything being this technically uh, beautiful, right? You don't think of technology as beautiful, but this crew is about this thing is beautiful. Like the way you think about it is is incredible, right? Yeah. And um, and so that drives them forward, is that this understanding that we are solving a really hard problem in a in an elegant and beautiful way, and, and this is what we care about. Yeah. That drives, it drives recruiting, it drives, you know, team de deployments and development and scale and all of those things. Yeah. Talk about also, like, so that you got this team, um, and so how they came together or how they're going to, you know, demonstrate, like, you want to bet on this team. It's not just, you know, sort of. Yeah, for sure. Well, it, I'll just talk about Fastly some more because I think it's a, it's a great example of this, which yeah. is here is a technical team and management team that existed in another company. There was a company called Wikia. And Wikia is a massive company. It, it, there's an immense amount of traffic that goes to, Wiki, uh, to Wikia. And they had a problem, and their problem was that wikis are always changing and always changing, and they wanted to use a content distribution network, something where they could push their content closer to their end users so that it was accessed more quickly. And everybody they talked to about this problem couldn't solve it. Their, their technical solutions could not allow you to push stuff to the edge and keep updating it as quickly as they needed to. Right. And as a result, they... It, 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 out of necessity, they built their own. They said, okay, well, we're going to have to figure out how would one would solve this. And again, to this, like, technical excellence, it was this incredibly beautiful problem, which is, oh, we have rapidly updating content. We have new ways of thinking about hardware and software and whatever. And they created a, a really fantastic solution for themselves. Mm -hmm. And they were so excited about it and so proud of what they'd built that they talked about it yeah. to their friends, all of their technical friends, like, ah, oh, we nailed it. Here's yeah. this thing. And then a beautiful thing happened. Their friends all said, can we use it? Yeah. <laughs> like, we want to use that. How can we use this thing? We have exactly the same problem. Yeah. And the byproduct of that was a team that said, we need to create a company that yeah. will solve this problem. And they emerged with a solution that they had built out of necessity that elegantly solved their existing problem and that they that pulled them out because yeah. there were customers who were saying, we need to use this. Right. We, why do you get to keep it to yourself? And we, you know, we need to use this thing. Yeah. Uh, that was the, you know, the, the epic birth story that then has resulted in what is now uh, you know, a content distribution network that serves massive companies, big traffic, really exciting stuff. So I think when you hear that kind of story, it answers lots of questions. It yeah. talks about team and cohesion and motivation. It talks about market and, and differentiation, all of these things that, you know, if you were, if someone was creating a, uh, a PowerPoint, oh, I'm going to cover market scale, I'm going to co cover, you know, differentiation, et cetera. And they don't have to do that. All they have to do is say, here's what happened, right? right? And it's so much more effective. And then you're making implicit judgments on, do I bet on these guys? And the simple story of their team, how they act together, their history, um, solves that problem, too. You don't have to sit there and, and question that as much. It's a tricky thing, I have to say. I mean, this is important, right, which is that story of the team coming together is a really important one. And sometimes it's this, we yeah. work together and we whatever, and so we, you know, and you say, oh, great. Yeah. Sometimes the story is, I knew this person, he, we were best friends since, you know, computer science class, you know, in high school. And so we've, we've always talked about doing something that, and you go, oh, that's great. Yeah. We were pitched yesterday on a business where the founders met on LinkedIn. Yeah. Now, 
you know, on the one hand, look, you should be allowed to meet great people on LinkedIn. Yeah. But it's a bad story. Right. Right. That's, oh, you met on LinkedIn. Yeah. That's the end of the story. Like, end of story. Yeah. That's not very so exciting. Right? Mental note for all of you in the audience using LinkedIn, go get a cup of coffee. Go to a bar. <laughs> go to a dance club. Take a walk. And Have a then, story. Yes, Have right. a story. Yeah. <laughs> So the third one um, that we've talked about in the past, we both share a, share a real passion for, is is the story of the user or the customer. How did your product or brand get used by the, the user or the customer to attain the goal, their goal and transform their life? And so you're really anchoring, so it's not really about you, it's not about the team, et cetera. It's really about this one person. Um, any other sort of tips on really developing that user story so that it persuades you, like, yep, this is gonna be big? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always, you know, look, in the end, there's no single great business that's been built on a single customer, Yeah. right? So there's always a starting point, which is I have, I have a customer who is using this, and that is sufficiently engaging to get you the next customer, et cetera. Um, I always think of this, particularly in the startup world, I talk about this. The fact that startups have any customers is miraculous. You should never work with a startup. Startups are you know, they likely will fail and go out of business. They have technical solutions that are unproven. There are all sorts of reasons why if you were a big company in the enterprise space, you wouldn't use a, a, a startup's product because right. it's crazy. Yeah. If you're a consumer and you're already on Facebook, or better yet, you're already on MySpace, why do you go to Facebook? Why do you start using Twitter if you already have a thing? Why are you using WhatsApp instead of, you know, Messenger or whatever? So the momentum is 100% against startups. And so the story, this, this capacity to tell the tale of here's how we got someone who should not have used our product to use our product um, is always powerful. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the more that customer is known to be terrible, yeah. the better. I won't use any names necessarily, but there are certain businesses in Silicon Valley that are known to be impossible customers. Yeah. And so when you come to me and pitch your business, or better yet, you go to a smaller company and say, oh, who are your, your customers? Oh, I have this particular customer. They say, how did that happen? Like yeah. why, you know, why are they using you? So, so it is a snowball effect that, it, that is, is incredibly powerful and you should understand that. You yeah. should understand that, that the message of each customer is a message of solving problems in the real world. And the story isn't, oh, I have a, a I'm, I'm embedded in blah. Right. It's so-and-so had a problem that they couldn't solve with the obvious, you know, I couldn't go to Oracle and solve this problem. I couldn't use Facebook and solve this problem. Um, and so when they looked for the solution, the solution came clear despite the fact that it was little and unproven and all the stuff. It was, oh, my God, this is so much better. Yeah. I have to try it. Yeah. It's a fantastic point, just this notion of who, in fact, even is the user. Um, and then the leverage, I mean, certainly from a marketing uh, perspective, you're seeing more and more companies not just, um, you know, be inspired by and retell and empower their user to tell the user story as a part of, you know, basically marketing um, the startup or the company and the innovation, but you're also seeing a closer and closer relationship between the user and customer and the actual company um, because co-development becomes important because some of these users are so influential that they can become much more you know, um, not only authentic and believable than the company can, but actually are more connected to the network um, that the company wants to reach. Well, to, to this point, I mean, this is, and I, I, I have stolen this playbook repeatedly, and obviously I don't think that, so I have a, a company I invested in called Splunk, and Splunk is this very nerdy tool that allows, that takes machine data, all sorts of data, and allows you to make sense of it. And their original customers were, you know, IT people are trying to keep the computers up. And then their next set of customers were security people trying to keep the network secure. And then compliance people trying, very nerdy, very technical. Splunk very quickly discovered, oh, this is a tool that solves all sorts of problems. And our customers are figuring out what those problems are. And there's no better way to get the next customer than to say, oh, this customer did this and this and this. 
But it turns out there's a thing that's better than me saying, oh, you know, this customer did X, Y, and Z. It's getting them to tell the story. And so Splunk has deployed their own customers to tell these triumphant stories. And you talked about this. This is make your customer the hero. Mm -hmm. This is in every instance, how does someone in a big enterprise, how are, how are they empowered to solve some big problem and save their company a bunch of time or money or um, you know, mechanized things that seemed impossible or whatever. And so in every instance, we at Splunk get the users on the stage, they tell their story and we say, oh my God, you are so smart, right? But yeah, you're smart for using our product, right? That's yeah. amazing. So now in every instance that I can make this work, I say, get potential customers in the room, whether it's a dinner yeah. or an auditorium, and get your existing customers to tell the story of how the, how it is making them heroic. Yeah. And that there that is the best sales technique I've ever seen. It, it will win every day if yeah. you have customers who will do it. Yeah, which also reminds you, pick the right customer. <laughs> yeah, well, that's helpful. Yeah. And then the fourth um, and sort of last um, sort of story that is certainly important from David's um, perspective and in his world is, you know, the reason why this is huge, you know. So you're using in this one, you know, both data, so trend data, um, you know, data from, you know, how companies are doing. And then, but you're architecting a narrative and an organizing framework so that the venture capitalist is making the inference in his or her own head this is going to be huge. Any mm -hmm. comments on this story? Yeah, I mean, it's, you need it in the yeah. venture business. I mean, it's funny. I, I say to people, look, in the end, venture capital is not for everyone. Venture capital comes with it a price, which is that if I'm going to invest $10 million in your business, your business actually has to be very big to make it my piece worth more than $10 million. Right. So when you come to me to tell me about your exciting technology, that story, you know, First of all, it has to be I'm solving a very acute problem and I can get those first set of customers. Right. But then simultaneously, the world is our oyster, right? There's some huge opportunity here that is transformative. And, and you have to believe both stories, and that's a very tricky thing. And great entrepreneurs are very good at that, about this, like, here's what we're doing. That's the boring stuff. The really exciting stuff is that when I have 100 million users, you know, then it's then think about this, right? I mean, we funded a company called Wattpad. Wattpad is this consumer experience where you where people are uploading stories and reading stories on their largely on their mobile devices. And the founders thought this was important. They care about stories. They care about the the, the written word. You know, but in the beginning, when it's just you know hundreds of people doing that, they say, "Oh, that's great." You know, yeah. some people reading some stories, or whatever. But now when it's tens of millions of people and there are hundreds of thousands of stories being uploaded on a daily basis and billions of minutes a month being spent consuming content, being reading, we're talking about people reading, it's pretty easy to sell that big story, right? You have folks like Margaret Atwood saying, like, this is important. Wattpad is important for the transformation of of the reading world that kids still read, that people still care about the written word, right? Yeah. So the story starts with, I have a technical solution that makes it easy to upload stories and consume them on a mobile device, but the big picture is, you know, and, and, and as far as this team is concerned, having tens of millions of users is the beginning, mm -hmm. right? And we, and, and so, so being able to tell that, and it doesn't matter what it is, right? My 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 buddy Rene Lassert, when he was pitching PayCycle, was I have seen the how hard payroll is. I've seen what a waste of time it is for people. We can make it better. We can make it an asset. It will transform the ability of millions of small business owners to re to regain control of their lives. And he's taking that one step further with Bill.com, his next company. He's, he's into the exciting stuff. Yeah. Start with payroll, move on to bills. Same thing. How do I manage accounts payable and receivable? Is that a big story? Well, yeah, it's a huge story if you think that this is how the entirety of small business is going to manage their business in a way that allows them the free time with their family, the ability to leverage their economics to, to grow their business, all these things, right? Yeah. So, 
everyone who who comes in and pitches successfully to, to my firm does so by saying, here's what we're doing now, and it's really interesting and valuable, and here's what it becomes if we're right. Yeah. And the if we're right part is what we invest in. Right. right. So, yeah, just, just helping create that, that structure so that uh, the investors want to um, invest. And so this idea of making it human-centered um, but also inspired is key. Um, so what I think we should do now is it's 1040. Um, we have uh, David and I put together a few um, questions that we could um, connect to, um, but we have been flooded with nice. um, other questions um, <laughs> that maybe we'll, we'll, we'll use instead. So let me just um, pick one of them, David. We have quite a few questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, if anyone has remaining questions after David and I finish Q&A, please feel free to uh, email me um, at jocker at stanford.edu or just Google Power of Story and my name and you'll come to a website where a lot of the answers to these questions at least are indirectly answered through readings and whatnot. Uh, David, through this set, is there any question or two that you think are, is particularly intriguing? I think there are a lot. One, there's one question that talks about um, to what degree this sort of uh, storytelling applies to nonprofits in fundraising in the same way that it applies to prop, to, prop, to for-profit companies in fundraising. And it, and, it, um, and it triggered something in my mind. You know, one of the things that's interesting and tricky about not nonprofits that I've seen is that they're very personality-driven. Oftentimes, there's a particular dynamic individual who, uh, who is telling that story and is so engaging and so spectacular that you, oh, write a check. I mean, here's yeah. a check. And of course, the tricky part is that it's that there that it's an ongoing process for these nonprofits. Um, the reality is that startups are the same way, right? That in the end, there is there is this interesting back and forth between the you know the CEO, the founders, the team story, and the aggregate story of this business. And and. I would say it's extraordinarily hard to raise money with an amazing story for your company and a lackluster story for your team, right? We are looking for leaders. We're looking for leaders who themselves have a powerful story. And the interesting thing and the best thing is when it, that story is first, how have I come to be who I am? Yeah. And as an inspirational leader for, for this business, and how did I come to this business? Like, why do I care about this business? And our best entrepreneurs, there's a very clear story about there's an amazing, you know, kind of mythology of the individuals, and then there's this amazing mythology of that leads to them coming to their particular business. Mm -hmm. And um, and so in that respect, for profit and nonprofits are really the same business. Which is why is it why are you this spectacular person you are, and why have you come to this hard problem you're solving? The more authentic that connection is. This is why business is where the answer to that is, I did a lot of research and I decided that this was a tough problem to solve. It's not very compelling, right? You listen to that story and you go, huh. So you could have done a bunch of things. And right? I went to LinkedIn and I found yeah, I found like <laughs> I found some people to help build it, right? You know. Oh my God, there's so many questions. Okay, another question that relates to the nonprofit one is about stories proven to spur action. So, um, if you guys Google, um, if you like, oh, I'm just like making yeah, that go check work. it out. <laughs> uh, Future of storytelling and Auker, my last name again, A A K E R. Um, up comes a little five-minute video um, that actually summarizes some of the research that um, is done by Deb Small and others that show why and when stories actually can fuel action. Now remember, it's not stories or data. So um, this guy or this person, I'm not sure if it's a guy or a gal, who's about to go off and do this pitch and is, is thinking about um, harnessing story to a greater degree in their pitch, um, if you're out there in the audience still, remember that it's the integration of data and story together. And sometimes you're going to lean into the story, sometimes you're going to lean into the data, but even if your your, your pitch is 90% trends and product features, et cetera, even that 10% of the narrative structure that you put around it so that, you know, the investor can indeed think it's going to be um, huge, hopefully, um, is, is, is powerful. So another question I thought was really interesting is um, this notion of 
um, motivating employees through ongoing storytelling to improve focus and then align the goals and objectives of the company. And, you know, there is actually a little bit of work in social psychology around goal alignment um, and, and this notion of how do you, how do you motivate. Um, and some of that work um, is summarized in The Dragonfly Effect, which is a book I wrote with uh, Andy and one of David's friends, too, my husband, Andy Smith. And one of the things that's most important in the model in that book is, is focus. What is the single focus goal of this story? And if you can get it reduced down to this is the goal. So David shares me, or shares with me a story about one of his companies or his son or whoever, and I know the goal of that story. I, he, he knows where it's supposed to land with me. That, by, by based on that process of knowing the goal and knowing the aha and it indeed landing well, Research shows that when that happens, goal uh, team teams are, are lined across silos. Um, the clarity of what the new product launches um, increases. Not only do the goals align, but people can work more in sync. So you got a new product. It has a really clear story. You know the goal of that story. It lands well. Research shows, and Steve Ballmer is a big um, proponent of this, that everything else is executional because now everyone's aligned, and so. Advertising, which is executional, can align with the story. You know, um, the CFO is aligned with the story. Operations is aligned with the story. Everyone's aligned. Mm -hmm. And so there is some empirical evidence to suggest that at least if your story can be anchored on a goal, you're going to get that goal alignment and increased productivity. So, what, uh, you know, one of my favorite things in the kind of storytelling universe is the T-shirt. I talk about T-shirts all the time, and in the startup world, T-shirts really matter. And it's because of this. It turns out, so how do you reinforce the message of the company? How do you create goal, mission-driven businesses or whatever? There are these interim goals. They're big picture goals, like organizing the world's information, right? Yeah. If you have that on a T-shirt, you're a young organization, and you have that on a T-shirt, it's like, well, that's what we're here for, right? And you walk around, you feel good about those T-shirts. Look at that. I'm organizing. Then you have these, like, point-driven focus. What do we have to achieve? So it's that T-shirts are always made uh, in startups, in well-run startups, when you have the first 1,000 customers, when you launch some new product, when you do these things, because people are so focused on this opportunity, this goal, and then when it's done, you celebrate it, and you don't just celebrate it for that moment. You celebrate going forward because it inspires that next thing. It inspires you to, oh, I, you have the Android T-shirt. I wish I had that one. Oh, you have the millionth customer T-shirt. Amazing, you know? So. I think that, you know, good storytellers, good companies that understand the power of that, understand that T-shirts are just another piece of it. Um, so there's a great guy named Adam Nash who now who was at LinkedIn, now runs Wellfront, and he let, wrote a great uh, blog post about this. If you want to look, we can go to Google that one. Uh, Adam Nash and T-shirts, and you'll find his blog post. Uh, that that he wrote after he and I had this long conversation about how much we love T-shirts and the importance of T-shirts. Yeah, and more generally, this notion of props, you know, just thinking about what props would support the story. Another person asked, um, can you talk more about the idea of authenticity more? And I don't know about you, but I think about it in two ways. One is authentic, authenticity is when the story and the data resonate, so that um, the story echoes back what you're seeing in the data, um, and you can take data from lots of different angles and, and vice versa. The second is a little bit more um, sort of, I don't know, softer, if you will. It's that um, when when you share a story and it comes across authentic, it feels very personal. And sometimes the more manufactured stories that feel less authentic, you basically are just losing that personal connection. Any thoughts on authenticity? Well, it, it reminds I used to be a litigator. Uh, and I remember talking with my, my boss, who was a very impressive litigator, had been very successful, and he said to me at the time, uh, as we were preparing witnesses, and I said, David, um, there's nothing more powerful than the truth. And he said, and in particular, because your witness can always remember it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And it's like, you know, that's the, the reality, and that's a little bit about this authentic authenticity question. You don't need to figure out how to string these things together to make them work. You don't have to remember yeah. what the myth is that led to this thing when it's the truth. Yeah. Uh, so look, in, in reality, we're always kind of morphing and pitching and, and molding this the, the, our own image, the image of our company. But if it's not based in fact, if it's not based in reality, it will blow up. 
eventually it will be completely clear that it's just not the reality of the company. And so don't try and be what you're not. Right. Right. You're, if you're not a di if you're not a dynamic storytelling, you know, inspiring, blah, 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 don't be that. Right. Be someone who, who, you know, inspires through numbers and product and whatever else. So I think authenticity is very clear and, 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 um, you know, like the Supreme Court said of pornography, you'll know when you see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I kind of want to end on porn, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many questions. A little intimidating. Um, so what I'm going to do is because we are um, only two minutes um, shy away from the end of this um, is uh, again invite you if you didn't get your answer uh, question answered to go ahead and email me at jocker at Stanford edu or just go online to Power Story and see. And I'm Hornick at August Cap, augustcap.com. So. Yeah, best storyteller ever. Um, oh, I highly that's recommend. a lot of pressure. Yeah, all right. <laughs> not, not the best, but maybe in, in venture. Oh, well, that, oh, that's a low bar. Definitely I'll at take, August I'll, Capital. Yeah, anything? all right, good. Thank Can you. Can we say Thank that you. in your I family? Good. No, I feel not good. your family. I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so anyway, it's been great to spend time with you. Um, yeah, so uh, again, I'd like to thank you both for spending this hour with us. It's been extremely interesting, and I think from the number of questions we've had, we obviously have not been able to get to all of them, but it definitely shows that these stories uh, generated a lot of thinking and, and, and curiosity with our audience. So I think that's, that's wonderful, and thank you again, everyone who attended, as well as our speakers, of course. Um, again, I would like to invite you to find out more about our courses at create.stanford.edu. Uh, thank you again, and I hope you have a wonderful day.